Hello, everyone. My name is Frank Sepulveda. Uh, first thing I want to clarify, because uh, someone already asked me this question, I do not work for Datastax. Okay? Uh, I actually work for Pioneer Natural Resources up in Dallas, uh, in Irving. I'm a data scientist, senior data scientist at Pioneer. In addition to that, that's my day job. Uh, my night job is a PhD candidate at Baylor University in geophysics. So uh, that's the uh, other thing I do. The work that I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, this work that we're doing right here for the US Department of Energy. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into this and see how it goes. So what are we trying to do? This is me and my collaborators at Baylor. What we're trying to do as part of that uh, you know, funding opportunity that we got from the Department of Energy is to come up with a nodal solution that is capable of acquiring and transmitting and processing seismic data. OK, great. We have all kinds of nodal solutions, right? They're already existing, Fairfield, Zenodal. You know, there's a bunch out there, Surcell. So let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into that, right? So how many nodes are we talking about? What is our seismic processing method? And of course, what is go where is this going to happen and how long, right? So essentially, what we're trying to do is take a bunch of systems, put them out in the desert, collect some data, and do some ambient seismic interferometry, which is just a form of seismic processing at the edge. Just as a curiosity, how many people here work for oil and gas? Wow, OK, so you guys know what I'm talking about then, right? So you can see what we're shooting for, six days of collection outside in the you know, geothermal plant in Nevada. Follow that up with the question of, well, why is our solution necessary? Well, there's a couple of reasons why we need this nodal seismic solution that's capable of processing data at the edge. The main reason is, is that we're using passive seismic methods. Now, what that means is that we're not introducing sources into the ground. I'm sure you know, a lot of you are familiar with those big vibrating trucks that oil and gas uses. Those are active. right? You're putting energy into the ground, and then you know what you're putting in, and you know what you're getting back, essentially, right? So, or what you should get back. What we're using is we're using just recorded ground motions that are basically noise. This could be anthropogenic noise, man-made noise, or this could be just you know, natural occurring noise, micro seisms or earthquakes that are occurring. The reason why we're using these passive methods is, of course, reduce costs, lower impact to the environment, and also kind of lower the logistical effort required to do these sort of deployments. And I know I threw up there the number 150. So what? We do 10,000 node lines in oil and gas, right? Well, we're research. We're earthquake seismology, OK? So cut us a little slack. 150 is a lot for us. But with that being said, a couple other reasons why the solution was necessary, and I'm sure that you know, our endeavor isn't the only one. The, the tendency is to have more sensors at higher sample rates. And the reason is, is you know, there's a lot of uh, lateral heterogeneity. Just the Earth changes very abruptly from location to location. So you know, typically, you want to have better spatial sampling, which means more nodes. Of course, also, you know, I know there's probably some data scientists in the audience. If you're going to do some feature engineering, you want a data set that enables you to do some rich feature extraction preferably both in the time domain and the frequency domain and the wavelet domain and the curvelet domain. So you need higher sample rates, which means more data. The problem with that is the real world logistic constraints of doing this in the field, which are always going to be power and telemetry. If you have more radios transmitting at higher wattage over longer distances, that eats up more power, that shortens your deployment durations. So this is why we felt that this solution was necessary. So what's the problem? Well, under normal active source situations, you know when you put the energy into the ground. You know when you're done. With passive, how do you know when you're done? Right? You're just using ambient noise. So there's a couple different ways that you can tackle this problem. One is you can pull data nightly. But once again, this requires that you disturb your nodes. You have to walk the line, pull disks, take them back to your hotel room, copy the data into a laptop, and then look at it. Right? Which means you also probably have to stop acquisition, which isn't a good thing. You can do multiple field deployments, but of course, that introduces the problem of, well, now you have to deal with logistics and cost. There's money associated with these deployments. The other solution, which is typically what people do, especially in the research area, is just overcollect. We're going to do a two-week collect. Why? Because we have two weeks worth of money, and we're just going to do that, right? Which to me is not the best way to do this. The other thing that's an issue is data volume. We ended up settling on 144 station configuration. That was mostly because of symmetry. And you'll see the, the architecture later, and it'll make sense. But we're going to acquire six point, or excuse me, 622 million samples per day. That's a lot. 
I don't care who you are and what industry or in what science, that is a lot of data. The reality is, is that's just one channel at 50 hertz, right? 50 samples per second. We're actually acquiring three channels at 250 samples per second. But what I'm inserting into Cassandra is essentially a decimated and reduced version, because that's all we needed. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was you or me there, Keith? <laughs> um, so with that being said, uh, if you take the full bandwidth of the data, if it was not decimated and reduced, it would be uh, 9.3 billion samples per day, which once again, is going to be a phenomenal amount of data. And lastly, you know, this is a university project funded by the government, so it had to be cheap. We're trying to keep the cost per node way down. So what was the solution? So when I first uh, started attending Baylor, I had spent about 10 years working for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, uh, primarily in their R&D projects supporting geoscience-related stuff. And this is about as far into it as I can get. But one of the concepts that had come to me while I was doing this work is uh, we had a lot of vendors, you know, the, the big defense contractors that were always selling us these really high-end boxes that would acquire this, you know, seismic or acoustic or electromagnetic data. They were very expensive. And what I noticed is a lot of them struggled um, with consistency in the quality of the data. There would be crosstalk between channels. There would be GPS timing <coughs> errors. They were a very cottage industry. And it really had an impact on the type of science that we could do. So what I, when I came to graduate school, I asked my advisor, I said, hey, can I take a commercial off-the-shelf data acquisition system, which is this RefTech 13001. It's been around for 15 years. Anyone that's worked in earthquake seismology is familiar with it. Um, you know, actually, uh, Pascal, Iris, they're a, a group that maintains a large uh, inventory of sensors and data acquisition systems for the U.S. government. Has about like 800 of them that they uh, share with partners, uh, be it you know, uh, uh, universities and other people that are part of their consortia. And then if I add an embedded system, and for those of you that are not familiar with the Raspberry Pi, essentially what it is is it's a small single board computer. It's about $35. It came out of the UK. The reason why they invented the Raspberry Pi was they wanted to have an affordable solution so that young people, children, would be able to learn coding as well as interacting with hardware. Uh, the Raspberry Pi has sold tens of millions of units. How many people are familiar with the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, exactly. So it has just an extremely broad ecosystem and is an extremely versatile solution. So what I did is I integrated these two pieces of equipment and came up with what I call the rapier the Raspberry Pi enhanced RefTech. So what I did is I basically added to this data acquisition system a brain. And what I did is instead of the archive being saved to these compact flashcards that are inaccessible unless you pull them, right? And instead of having to transmit the data all the way back to the lab, you now built the archive at the edge, right? And here are some of the motivations and some of the factors that I took into this. You know, I needed data of sufficient quality, had to be inexpensive, using skills common to geoscientists. I didn't want us to have to collaborate with a computer science department or computer engineering departments. You know, just using what, you know, uh, geoscientists know. And then, of course, I wanted to be able to leverage existing methods and tools. No need to invent new algorithms, right? Yes? How much is a rough tech? I think it's about 7,000. We borrowed those. We didn't buy them. Oh, okay. Now, the interesting thing is there's other work that's been done by some other authors where they took the ISI Sigma, which is a couple thousand. It's one of the ones that, uh, it's that group up at uh, Ponca City. You said they, it's like an oil and gas uh, nodal system. They've integrated it with a Raspberry Pi as well. Pretty much, if you have a system that records seismic data that you can compile its software for the ARM architecture, which the Raspberry Pi uses an ARM architecture, uh, you can save anything to it. So we borrowed the systems from Iris. We didn't have to buy them. That's, that's, does that answer your question there? Yeah. Well, for $7,000, does it have any storage? Or storage is all off board? Compact flashcards. In there. Yep. yep. And typically, the ones that they provide are two or four gigabytes. Right? Those are the only ones that are vetted, which, once again, doesn't give you a whole lot of collection at high sample rates. So. This was great, and I got a publication out of it in 2016. My advisor said, good job, Frank. He said, however, this is a great single node solution. All the science that we do as geoscientists is multi-node. We're comparing signals between different station receiver pairs, right? So what are we going to do? What do I need? Well, what I need is an at-the-edge-based database. 
So I didn't go into this thinking Cassandra or Datastax. I went into this saying, I have a list of requirements, which is, I think, how all technology endeavors should begin, right, with a list of requirements. I needed something that could deploy on modest hardware. I needed something that was open source distributed and decentralized. I needed something that would work as clusters of nodes. I needed peer-to-peer. -peer. I needed, I couldn't deal with a, uh, you know, uh, master worker architecture, right? It needed to be peer-to-peer. -peer. I needed something that was elastically scalable. It could go from, you know, a dozen nodes to 100 nodes to thousands of nodes. It wouldn't matter, depending on what we were trying to do. I needed highly available and fault tolerant, and I especially needed it to be ideally suited for time series data. I don't know if anybody has any experience working with SQL and time series data. Does not go well, right? There are better databases for time series data, NoSQL being one of them. So after I did all of my research, I came up with a conclusion that, you know what? I like this Apache Cassandra thing. The dilemma was the Raspberry Pi and its very modest capabilities, right? You're talking a gig of RAM. You're talking uh, you know, a 10 by 100 NIC on that. Uh, you're looking at shared uh, I.O. between the USB and the Ethernet, you know, kind of limitations of the equipment, right? So it was really a question of performance tuning. Let's see how much juice we can squeeze out of that. So our first attempt was back in June of 2017. What we did is we went to this geothermal field outside of Fallon, Nevada. It's a Soda Lake field event. And we put 20 seismic stations out, which you can see right there along that line. The line was about 575 meters. And uh, you know, it was about 30 meter spacing. And what we did, and this is kind of what the, the architecture looks like, is we put each one of these seismic stations, which was a rapier, had a Raspberry Pi, which was running Apache Cassandra. So you ended up with a 20 node data center. And uh, since there, I know there's some folks in here that are not very familiar with Apache Cassandra, cluster is top level, data center, and then node, okay? Data center doesn't mean data center like it does in IT. Data center just basically means a collection of nodes. They can be in the cloud, they can be on, it can, it can be whatever, right? It's just a, kind of like a logic organization. But with that being said, I had a 20 node data center which was handling my transactional workload, which was basically taking the files from that ref tech, converting them out of a proprietary format, and then writing the data into Apache Cassandra. That data was then replicated to a three node data center, which was at the center of our array, which was then connected to a laptop, which was running the seismic analysis software. Any questions on the architecture here or the terminology that I use? Yes, sir. I was able, they do, they do not have an open interface. Uh, I was fortunate in that I was able to, so first off, uh, clarification, RefTech is owned by Trimble, right? So it's Trimble slash RefTech, uh, right? Uh, so just for clarification, if you're Googling them, you'll, that, that's the way to look for them is to look through Trimble. But no, they, they don't actually have an open protocol. They have an RTP protocol, which is their RefTech protocol, right? So what I did is I had a version of their acquisition software that was compiled on the ARM architecture and I was given that by RefTech, and that's what I used. So basically, they provided me their archive software, and I just ported it onto the Raspberry Pi. So the results, the science, it worked. Uh, here you can see a shot gather from some hammer blows at one of the stations. You can see the straight lines indicating some direct arrivals there. Of course, you've got your compressional waves, your shear waves, VPS, uh, you know, VPVS ratios are there. Uh, you'll notice, like, hey, wait a second, Frank, what's happening here with node number six? Well, it didn't work perfectly. The science worked. The technology, this was our first go. You can notice there's some gaps in the data here, right? So let me explain what happened. Stations one through seven and 10 dropped telemetry at some point. Uh, stations that, of course, didn't experience any sort of power failure or telemetry issues, you know, 99.9% .9 of the data files that were created by the RefTech were copied onto the Raspberry Pi, so that worked really well. But only about 92.5% of our data was actually inserted into Apache Cassandra for this test run. Now, there were three reasons. One, we were using very cottage industry components, home routers, right? Just standard equipment that you would just use in the household. So um, we were using very inexpensive DC to DC converters that said they were 3 amp that really weren't 3 amp. And the Raspberry Pi needs 2.4 amps, preferably 2.5 amps. So we ran into some issues there where nodes were dying. The Wi-Fi dongles that we were using were very cheap Wi-Fi dongles, which sometimes would basically just conk out on us, right? So 
we ended up with part of the network not being able to talk to the other network. And of course, Cassandra doing what Cassandra does, which is just power through it, said, well, those nodes are deprecated. I'm going to keep in certain data and move on. Right? And then lastly, we would just get some random failures where nodes would just die. And uh, the reason is, is Cassandra runs in a JVM. Raspberry Pi has one gigabyte of RAM. I ran it headless, but even then, there just wasn't a whole lot of, of RAM left. So any, you know, and I am not an expert in the garbage collection on JVM. If you, if you want to know more about that, go see John Haddad's talks. Uh, he works for Last Pickle. He's got a bunch of videos online. He, could talk, he can talk you in circles about JVM and performance tuning. But with that being said, or talk to some of the data folks, guys, data stacks folks, um, Cassandra was just a little too much for the Raspberry Pi. Wasn't a lot of overhead you know, available. So kind of summarizing what that all means, we realized the advantages of doing science at the edge. We were able to kind of do a continuous assessment by processing the data hourly in batch, which is what worked best for our seismic method. Uh, we had the option to leave the array out there longer or shorter if we got the convergence that we were looking for. And then, of course, we had a high level of confidence that the uh, survey was completed, right? We knew when we were done, which is difficult in passive seismic methods. But the recommendations that we came up with after that first event was we needed a better architecture. We needed some better tech. We needed to scale up to 150 nodes. The first year of this work for DOE was 20 nodes. Next year, second year funding was contingent upon delivering approximately 150 nodes. We needed a robust architecture that could handle failure. And of course, we needed to transition from this one cluster with you know, big data center, another data center, to something that was a little bit more nimble. And then, of course, we need to be able to exercise more control over the data traffic. So with that being said, I did my research. Yes, sir? No, you give me a chance to drink water. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Our, so what we're doing is we're stacking data to converge to the greens function, right? So this is a seismic thing, not convergence from a database, you know, as far as what is here is here. This is a, a seismic processing artifact that we're looking for, which is to say it is zero when it is supposed to be zero. So essentially it's like knowing when you're done. If your signal is no longer improving, you're done. What's the question? Oh, I'm sorry, the question was convergence. He was asking what I meant by convergence. What I was saying was that he, he was uh, thinking that I was talking about database convergence, like as far as uh, kind of like ACID, you know, compliant. Like, no, I was talking, this is a seismic signal. So, but sorry about that. Stopping criteria. You, yeah. It's not, it's not that you really run it for some random amount of time. You run it in real life, you would run it until it converged on the seismic. Signal. On the solution, correct. That's, that's the whole point behind it is to know when you're done. You can model it, but the issue that you have is the, you're going off of ambient noise. So for instance, if a train happens to be coming by, you fill in some frequencies. If there happens to be a small seismic event, micro seismic event, a little, you might fill in some other frequencies. No one source produces all the frequencies that you're interested in. Human noise is typically above 10 hertz. So convergence is frequency band by frequency band, and you have to decide if you're gonna wait for the missing band in a sense, convergence is basically you've just arrived at a solution. We can talk offline. Yeah. Uh, so moving forward, what I did is I upgraded the embedded system for Cassandra. So instead of running it on a Raspberry Pi, I started running it on an Asus Tinker. Tinker is very similar to the Raspberry Pi, but it has a second gig of RAM. It has two gigs of RAM. I added, a, uh, I modified the workload to the, to the Rapier, to the Raspberry Pi, because basically I had one seismic system per Raspberry Pi. And if I'm not running Cassandra on it, that thing's going to be sitting there idle the vast majority of the time. So I upped it to three seismic systems per Raspberry Pi, primarily, once again, to reduce cost. I utilized DSE advanced replication, which I'll talk about in a second. And then, of course, I kind of made some I guess, ideological decisions to be creative with a solution, but then also not to do anything weird with Cassandra. And I know that there may be some IT professionals in the room. You know what I mean by weird, where, where you use a piece of software or a solution in a way that it wasn't intended because it satisfies your immediate need, but long term it's not sustainable. That's what I mean by weird. Doing some crazy stuff with key spaces or tables or whatnot in Cassandra. So DSC is, is, a, is a product that is an add-on, right? And uh, you know, James talked about graph and solar, right? Uh, full index searching, and he talked about Spark. Uh, but another product that DataStacks offers is advanced replication. And what advanced replication does is it basically allows two different clusters 
to talk to each other in a way such that if the communications link between them goes down, when that link comes back up, it just starts talking again. This is uh, developed for applications such as oil and gas, where you have a rig communicating back to headquarters, you have a rig communicating back to headquarters. The two rigs don't need to talk to each other, but they both need to talk back to headquarters. And then headquarters needs to replicate the data to a different data center, maybe in another location or in the cloud, right? Which uh, DataStax, Apache Cassandra, is really good at doing this sort of replication from location to location, as Joe says, automatically. So this is what I was leveraging with advanced replication, this hub and spoke topology. So with that being said, let me introduce you to the architecture and some of the players here. The symbols here, you know, purple triangle is the RefTech, square is Raspberry Pi, circle is the Asus Tinker. So what you have is nine RefTechs connected to three Raspberry Pis, connected to one Asus Tinker. This is called a flight. I came up with this name while I was sitting at the bar in New Orleans waiting for a plane. You can imagine what I was drinking. <laughs> You take multiple flights, and you end up with a squadron. OK? So, uh, so Cassandra is not running anymore on the Pi's? It is not running on the Pi's. I'll show you a slide right now where Cassandra is actually running. I'm just introducing the characters right now. But good question. And of course, each squadron has to have a headquarters. The headquarters would be some centralized location. In our case, it's the center of the line where our little tent is. But it could be anywhere. It could be in the cloud. Could be on the moon, doesn't matter. So where is Cassandra running? To answer the gentleman's question, what we have now is a four node cluster, which is handing our transactional workload running on the ACES tinkers, that is then replicating data using advanced replication to a four node cluster running at headquarters. And this is per squadron, right? And then of course attached to this is where I have my laptop, and actually we're using an Intel Nook just because it's lower power and I kind of broke my laptop the last time I was in the desert, so I don't want to do that again. Um, so that's what the architecture looks like. So let's talk about the connectivity, how everything is connected. Between the RefTech and the Raspberry Pis, everything's hardwired. And the main reason is, is the only way for us to really make, there's no Wi-Fi option on the RefTech that I'm aware of. And the only way we could do it is if we were to use some Ethernet bridges, which once again, you know, apparel cost you, you know, five to nine hundred dollars, which is kind of cost prohibitive. So these stay hardwired. So essentially, what we do is we just stretch them using Ethernet cable down the line. The next level here is the connection between the Raspberry Pis and the Asus Tinkers. Well, the Raspberry Pis have Wi-Fi capability, and the Tinkers have Wi-Fi capability, but they also have Ethernet capability. So this can be either hardwired or wireless. Above that. You then have wireless connectivity between the squadron and the headquarters. Now, obviously, at this point, you're dealing with distances that go beyond the 300 feet that you're allowed for Ethernet or that is recommended for Ethernet. But if you had media converters, you could convert it to fiber. It doesn't matter. It's using TCP IP, right? And then, of course, at the headquarters level, now these are all sitting next to each other. They're all hardwired through a switch. There's no reason to connect them through anything else. They're literally sitting right next to each other on a rack. So that's kind of the architecture. Any questions here? Good. Quick question. Yes. Okay. The process in it is a full day packet in the headquarter. What the headquarter node is doing is it's serving up the data from for a query, right? So the dilemma with time series data is if I were to use something like you know MySQL or something at the edge, the performance is very slow. I can write data for each node for an entire squadron, if I'm doing them all at the same time, I can get about maybe 1,400 writes per second at each node, which is fast enough to handle my 50 hertz, one channel, you know, nine seismic systems. And when I'm reading, I don't have any benchmarks because I'm testing it right now, but I can pull an hour's worth of data for an entire squadron, I want to say in about seven minutes. Right, so you're looking at you know, 60 times 60 times 50, whatever that is. So basically, I'm able to query the data out very quickly, considering the very modest hardware that I'm using. And the reason that is, and this gets a little deeper into Apache Cassandra, but what it is, is and this just happens to be the structure of Apache Cassandra and, of course, data stacks, is that time series data is written to disk sequentially based on a partitioning algorithm. 
So when I say pull an hour's worth of data for a specific station, for a specific channel, it knows exactly where that data is on the SD card, right? And it goes exactly to that location and reads off that hour's worth of data, which is how we're able to get these read and write speeds. Uh, once again, I leave it to the data stacks folks, or if you want to talk offline to answer some more in-depth questions around the, the actual you know, underlying architecture of Cassandra, I'm happy to talk about it. It's what? It's all, it's all noise. Yeah. We are introducing no signals. We may get some random signals that occur, some impulsive signals, but we are, it's all noise. Yeah, so you pull every bit mm -hmm. of that time series especially to the head of water. Correct. That's a lot of the data goes through the bandwidth of the wireless. How much of that cost? So the reason why we have to use all of the data is, uh, it's from a seismic perspective, what ends up happening is you basically stack the data. Noise has a tendency of canceling out. Yes. Signal has a tendency of multiplying, right? So essentially, or, you know, of stacking up. So that's essentially what we're doing. So we're just pretty much acquiring all the noise, stacking it, which is why we pull out all of it hourly, and it just continuously feeds into our, our processing and just improves our result. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So you can send a much less data back into the head of water. You out here at the edge? Yeah. We could. The sacrifice would be, uh, so one of the things about, about Cassandra and Datastax is it's typically architected or deployed in a multi-workload fashion. So for instance, you have clusters that are dedicated to transactions. You have clusters that are dedicated to analytics. If you're going to need Spark, you stand up a cluster, you replicate the data, you run Spark on that. My concern would be by trying to do any additional processing out here, we would potentially cause problems with the ingest of the data, but there's a very simple solution for that. Add another data center out here and make this a two data center cluster. All it's gonna cost you is four more ACES tinkers, which is about $180. So you could do that if, if it could be done. We can talk offline. As far as error, as far as the data ingest? Yeah, because Cassandra has some requirements, you know, you need a lot more nodes to make the work properly. It, it is a fast, but there are some... It's a trade-off. It, yes. it, it's a performance. Exactly. I mean, the limit to how much data you would want to put on an individual Cassandra node is about two terabytes. So we're way under that, right? The issue here is the modest, the limiting factor is the modest capabilities of these nodes and the telemetry method that we're using. But we'll, I got like one more slide and then we can talk. All right. So with that being said, what's next? Uh, so this talk, I was originally planning on giving it Datastax Accelerate. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, Datastax Accelerate is gonna be you know, kind of like a Cassandra summit that's gonna be held in Maryland uh, in a, I guess about less than a month, a little bit, about a month from now actually. And uh, unfortunately, I'm gonna be in the field. So I was supposed to give this talk on the 22nd, but uh, some schedules shifted a little bit to the right, and now I'll be unable to attend. So you're the only ones that get to see this talk, right? Um, with that being said, you know, just to kind of summarize once again, we're looking at 145, 44 seismic stations, 48 Raspberry Pis, 32 tinkers. We're looking at DSE running with Apache, uh, excuse me, with advanced replication. We have these, you know, here's squadron, 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 squadron. So we've got four destination clusters, four source clusters, three telemetry options. So what we're going to do is do different iterations. Uh, we're going to start off with a wired option for two days and swap over to uh, hybrid and then swap over to wireless. And really what I'm looking at, the bottleneck once again is the telemetry, is that write rate, how fast I can write data into the cluster and replicate it across. That's my, that's my throttling point. We're going to test it with three different considerations because what I'd like to do is in this publication, which is the goal of all this, is to have some curbs that I can say, here's what you should expect. Right? When you switch telemetry methods, this is the best case, this is the worst case. Here's what this all looks like. <laughs> this is my lab at Baylor. 
Uh, these are the ref techs. As you can see, there's a, a bunch of them. And uh, what I'm doing right here is I'm doing some configuration as well as uh, you know, just kind of some testing. Uh, we're testing radios kind of, you know, we don't want to go out there without having done all the telemetry tests because that can be a bear. Uh, here you can see the rack. So this rack has the 48 Raspberry Pis and uh, 16 uh, Asus Tinkers. And then off picture over there on another rack is the other 16 Tinkers. Uh, here's kind of like a closer up. This is my bedroom, uh, my apartment, which is about 15 degrees hotter than the rest of my apartment. And so you know why. Now, what does this node look like? Uh, once you button it up, it's very unassuming. It's just an action packer. And what it has is it has a battery, and the ref tech goes right here. You have a switch. You have a DC to DC converter. And then, of course, right here, you have the uh, Raspberry Pi uh, mounted or the Asus Tinker mounted with a little dongle. And then, of course, there's an antenna sitting on top. I'd like to say thank you to you all for coming out to hear me talk. Uh, I'd like to thank my advisor, of course, as well as my collaborators at Baylor. Uh, I'd like to thank the DataStax folks for helping uh, organize this, as well as the uh, Houston uh, Energy Data Science uh, Meetup Group. And lastly, uh, you know, I'd like to thank the Department of Energy for giving me money. <laughs>